Okay, uh, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Policing and the Big Society. Um, the Crime and Justice Unit at Policy Exchange has wanted to do this event for, um, for some time. Uh, we've always felt that actually the Big Society approaches are particularly ripe in the, in the policing and criminal justice space. Um, and it's clearly a hot topic today. Baroness Newlove has um, produced her own report as well on active communities, which some of you may have seen. Um, from our point of view, there are sort of three essential elements to the, the big society which seem to have some impact now on, on what policing is and what it might be in the future. Decentralisation, the idea that more power is given away from the centre down to the local, and be that police forces, councils or local communities. Um, the bringing in of new providers, private sector, voluntary sector, and lastly, volunteerism, the idea of charities, voluntary sector groups, individuals volunteering and supporting the police in their work. And what is the aim of the big society approach in policing? Is it about giving the public some ownership? Is it about sharing the burden from the police across other agencies and individuals? Or is it about reducing demand on policing? And it may of course be, be all of those things. This event was deliberately built policing and the big society not the police and the big society, or policing the big society. Um, it's, in fact, you could say, and this might be something we can discuss later, that um, a society which has more big society elements is a society which is more self-policing. Um, so that's just a few opening thoughts. Um, we'll turn to the panel for obviously more in-depth um, expertise on these issues. But let me just explain the format today. So we were, as you're aware, expecting that way the government's advisor to join us, but unfortunately that's not been possible. So instead, kindly the Minister of State for Policing, Nick Herbert, has agreed to briefly speak. Unfortunately, um, he has a prior commitment in Parliament to 13 justice questions, which means I'm going to ask Nick to speak first, um, but so you're not all deprived, I'll then open that up immediately for questions, so that if you want to ask Nick some questions if you can. Nick will then um, depart and then I'll introduce the panel and we'll open it up to each of the panellists to say a few words and then and then questions. So I'll hand over to Nick now and, uh, and then we'll, uh, we'll make a start. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Blair. It's a pleasure to be back at Policy Exchange where uh, I was also having breakfast uh, this morning and I'm delighted to step in for uh, that way. I've been uh, hurtling by foot around London this morning from one meeting to another and I would like to emphasize that my visibility and availability uh, is high today on behalf of uh, the public. I'm sorry that I'm going to have to leave but I'm also a Justice Minister and I have to be in Parliament <coughs> to do Justice questions. I'm not going to make a formal speech, I'd just like to make a few remarks to frame the debate, very interesting debate that you're uh, going to be having and I really am genuinely sorry that I'm going to miss uh, the contribution of the other speakers. Firstly, it seems to me that Blair is right, that uh, the big society is not just about volunteering. It is sometimes understood to be principally about volunteering. That's a really important component of the concept. But there are these other two key elements uh, that are about returning power to people and communities in the agenda of decentralisation uh, and of reform of public services, opening up services to new provision, uh, including by the private and the not-for-profit sector. And uh, it seems to me that uh, these are all areas where the government's police reform uh, agenda is indeed uh, reflecting uh, that idea of building the big society, that in relation to decentralisation, uh, we are returning <coughs> power to people by the uh, replacement of police authorities with directly elected police and crime commissioners and the bill is currently before the Commons uh, to talk about that and I discussed that yesterday and how I believe that that will actually be a benefit to all of those uh, involved, not to just the public in terms of the connection that they will have with the police where I think there is a democratic deficit, uh, but actually also police uh, forces uh, and uh, the whole police workforce uh, from the greater uh, freedom and responsibility that I think that, that will give them as the grip of Whitehall is uh, reduced. Secondly, in the area of uh, public sector reform and uh, opening up uh, the provision of public services to new providers, 
Uh, we know that police forces uh, face significant spending challenges over the next uh, few uh, years. Uh, they're having to play their part in reducing the deficit. We believe this is a challenging but manageable uh, settlement for them. Uh, but it will require, I think, a fundamental redesign of the policing model. And uh, I believe that there is a, a great role for uh, new providers uh, to come in and help the police provide their services. Uh, and we've already seen that in relation to uh, back and middle office policing services. Uh, and uh, we can reach out, uh, in my view, uh, beyond uh, some of the visible services that are provided by police into areas that are indeed part of the front line, uh, that are the more visible aspects of policing, but nevertheless could be done uh, by others sharing uh, with the police force uh, themselves, with police officers and with uh, others who work for police forces. So, for instance, we've already seen uh, custody uh, suites uh, uh, contracted out to the private sector. There is a far greater opportunity for this uh, in the future. Uh, and I think we need to be driven not just by the idea that this will save money, but also by the idea uh, that this will produce a better service uh, for the public. There should be no ideological objection, in my view, uh, to that greater involvement. And thirdly, in relation to the voluntary sector, which is perhaps the principal focus of uh, the event uh, uh, today, interestingly, uh, given Sir Robert Peel's dictum that the police are the public and the public are the police, there is actually a relatively low level of community activism uh, in relation to uh, policing. Uh, we know that something like 3% of the public are already involved with their police or council in relation to uh, these services. And I think the interesting question is, how can we encourage greater public involvement in the arena of uh, community <coughs> safety? Uh, the police cannot uh, fight crime alone. It seems to me that the police absolutely rely on a partnership with the public uh, to uh, do that. And I think that is something that is not contentious, that is something the public would accept. Look at the millions of people that are involved, for instance, in Neighbourhood Watch, uh, as, as an example of where people accept a, a shared responsibility with the police of ensuring that they themselves, not just uh, individually, but their own communities uh, are safe. What new ideas could we take forward and encourage uh, that would in, uh, encourage further this idea of community uh, activism? Well, firstly, uh, in, in relation to Neighbourhood Watch, are there more active ways that we can develop these kinds of schemes? <coughs> We've already seen, for instance, uh, the growth of uh, things like street pastors uh, and Phil Kedge is here who will be talking about Street Watch as an example of civilian patrols. That's something that I think is uh, both interesting and encouraging in terms of a police-led, nevertheless uh, community-engaging scheme uh, that uh, involves members of the public. I went down and saw one of Phil's uh, uh, schemes in Hampshire and I was very struck when I talked to one of his uh, activists uh, and uh, the person said to me, look, you know, we're not the police, we're the public. Don't let's uh, run away with the idea that such uh, volunteering, that such activism is a substitute for police officers. It is not. No. It, is, it, is, it is an additional civilian activity that helps to keep uh, people safe. And I believe that we should be doing everything we can to encourage that greater sense of community activism uh, that is about people joining in, working for themselves, but also for each other uh, in their communities. Secondly, I think that we can look at how we broaden uh, the police family, those who actually do uh, exercise some kind of uh, authority. We've already seen this in relation to the development of PCSOs, uh, which I welcome. Uh, I think they play a very important role within the police family. But what also about wardens? I've seen from my own constituency and around the country the valuable role that wardens can play. Uh, and I saw that on Saturday uh, in my own patch. Wardens working alongside children who were junior wardens uh, in a scheme to encourage that form of civic activism 
uh, and the relationship that the police must have uh, with the public. Uh, again, I think the wardens are not a substitute for police officers, but they are an important and additional resource uh, that can work alongside uh, policing teams and help to ensure that neighbourhoods oh. are safe. And of course, wardens, where they're funded by local communities, have those communities have a very strong sense of, of ownership over uh, their, their wardens, uh, a sense of pride in what their wardens uh, are doing. Thirdly, in relation to special uh, constables, it, it's interesting that historically, partly as a legacy of the war, there was something like 60,000 specials <coughs> in this country. That number fell over the decades and reached a low relatively uh, recently. It has now started to increase. Uh, there were 11,000 specials in 2004. There are now uh, over 15,000. I think we need to be encouraging uh, specials in police forces. Uh, they can, again, be a fantastic additional resource for police forces. Again, we must take on the argument that this is any kind of substitute uh, for regular officers. All the officers I talk to who are working with specials regard them as a helpful additional uh, resource. But of course, they also help to provide that bridge between the police and their uh, communities, and it's an incredibly <coughs> positive uh, thing. Uh, it's important that forces and officers are positive about specials and the role uh, that they can play. I could go on enlisting the additional uh, schemes, but I just want to say this in conclusion. This is not about central direction. This is not about central plans. This is not about some great master plan from the Home Office about how all of this is to be uh, dictated and driven. Of course we must enable stuff, we must be receptive to how we can get out of the way and foster uh, the, 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 the development of this kind of volunteering. In the end this is about what people are doing and it's about what forces are doing to uh, help that sense of activism. But don't let's be cynical about it, it's out there. People want to be involved more. We can facilitate that through ideas like Police.UK, uh, where 400 million hits have been received on that policing website, not just telling people about crime, but who to go and talk to. Uh, we can do things to help, but in the end, this has to come from communities themselves, and it has to be fostered by police forces working with those communities. As Sir Robert Peel said, and I'll repeat, the police are the public, and the public are the police. The Big Society is about breaking down the, uh, the notion that there is a barrier between the police uh, and the public and ensuring that there is a spirit of partnership and shared responsibility for keeping people safe. Thank you. We've got time for a few questions if there's any questions from the floor. I'm Peter Bottom from the House of Commons. In addition to what Nick's told us, can I just tell you about one thing which is pre, now it's pre-big society, pretty effective. In 1979, 1,800 people died when a driver was above the legal limit. It's now about 350. There's been no significant change of law, sentencing, or enforcement. What actually happened, certainly from the mid-80s, is hosts started providing alcohol-free drink, Passengers started picking alcohol free drivers, and those people like me who drink and drive tried to decide which it was each day. If we had about 1,800 people each week who for the first time committed a serious criminal offence, and probably going on doing it for three years, we ought to try to work out what are the levers by which we can bring that 1,800 down to 900, and the three years down to a year and a half, and then the police becomes easier. Okay, can we get some more questions together? No? Um. It looks as if for the next it looks as if for the next few years anyway, and I'm Meryl Stevenson from the Economist, for the next few years anyway, an increasing proportion of police and time and indeed budget will be spent on maintaining public order. Are there any lessons from Saturday's demonstrations uh, uh, to be gleaned in light of this policing big society interface? And sure. Sean Lynn from the Times. Um, can I just ask Nick um, Dennis O'Connor has said this morning that it will be very difficult to protect the front line uh, given the extent of the spending cuts and the means the front line as he has defined it this morning. Isn't it the reality that there some of the ideas you're talking about, about wardens and more specialists, they will be a substitute for police officers in terms of visible, visible police officers on the front line? Um, firstly, in relation to public order, I mean, the police always uh, have to respond to uh, public order situations and their, their 
uh, the Met have to deal with um, large numbers of events in relation to Hollywood policing in every year. Obviously, there are a number of major events coming up in relation to things like the Royal Wedding this year, uh, next year, uh, the uh, Olympics, and uh, there are I think, new challenges in the form of things like EDL marches uh, and so on, and there may be protests. Uh, it is part of the core business of policing uh, to deal uh, with that, and uh, I think it was quite wrong. Uh, that the men face such criticism uh, in, 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 from some elements uh, over the way in which they responded to a very difficult situation on uh, Saturday. And I think that this <coughs> shouldn't be focused on extremist minority uh, who caused such damage and active violence against police officers. Um, in relation to Sean's question, um, this is it, a report which I understand is being published uh, tomorrow at uh, Sean. Um, I've already noted that uh, a third of uh, all spending on police forces is uh, not on the front line, it is in the back and middle office. Uh, but we must be very careful not to be hung up on inputs here. Uh, we are absolutely clear that the priority must be to protect frontline uh, services, and I don't know a chief officer or a police uh, commander who does not agree with that objective. Everybody is uh, wanting to do that. Uh, but this is not a numbers game. This is a question of the quality of the frontline at service. And uh, HMIC has been clear that there are opportunities to redesign policing so as to drive up productivity in the frontline uh, and deliver more from less. And uh, I am confident that with uh, the right uh, solutions, uh, including the engagement of the private sector where appropriate in terms of uh, developing a radical agenda for uh, sharing services, including a program of driving procurement, uh, and all of the other areas where we've identified over two billion pounds worth of savings that could be uh, made by uh, police forces, that that frontline service can be protected. <coughs> time for this, so um, <laughs> I'd love to stay uh, and engage more. I really am sorry that I'm not going to be able to. Thank you very much for having me. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Mick. Now, um, we've had this sort of government perspective, and now we've got a very distinguished panel to, to follow. Uh, firstly, I'm going to ask them to come up in, in, in order and then to speak for five to ten minutes to talk to the issue of the big society in policing and how they see it. Um, from their perspective. So, um, to give the senior uh, officer's perspective, Sarah Thornton is Chief Constable of Thames Valley. Um, she's spoken out publicly about the benefit and the advantage that specials can provide um, to officers, most recently in an article in Telegraph. Um, following her, Philip Kedge is a district commander in the Hampshire Police. Uh, I, I met Philip um, about six months ago when I myself went down to see scheme that he pioneered, which is now rolling out across the country. He'll say more about Street Watch, but it's regulated citizen patrols in partnership with the police, and perhaps one element of, of that big society approach. And then lastly, to give us an absolute <coughs> perspective on what the, what the research tells us about what the public want, and about what the big society might mean in policing, we have Professor Martin Innes, who's the director of the Police Science Institute at Cardiff University. Once they've all um, spoken, we'll then open up to a general Q&A, so um, please do feel free afterwards to ask each of the panellists questions. But uh, we'll start with uh, Sarah. Thank you very much indeed. Um, good afternoon, everybody. I thought I might start off with a definition, and I think the point that's already been made about uh, a breadth to the term of big society is quite useful. Um, there was a conference down in Cardiff, which uh, Martin, I think, was hosting last month, and uh, Professor Rob Morgan did a paper and uh, he made a comment at the end, which I thought was quite a useful uh, place to start. Big society could signal more constructive, genuine engagement in policing by the community. A more positive approach with regard to disadvantaged victim offender groups, and maybe controversially, a more parsimonious use of the criminal justice system, which has in recent years arguably been used in an unsustainable and damaging degree. And what I've just used that project, I don't necessarily agree with everything Roger said, but actually, big society and policing isn't just about special constables. I think there's a very great potential to do much, much more than that. 
In terms of the points I'll make, I think I'll just talk about the past, the present and the future, make it quite simple. I was going to talk, start with Sir Robert Peel, but the police minister beat me to it twice. <coughs> Uh, for those of you who are not students of Peel, he was quoting uh, Peel's seventh principle about the police, the public, the public the police. Uh, it's always a good place to start because it just shows you uh, the sense in which uh, that relationship has been uh, uh, in place for, for 180 years. But I guess that was 180 years ago, and I, I think over the last 20 years maybe, a couple of developments which arguably have placed that intention. Um, when an organisation uh, like the police service, in common with many other services, has professionalised, um, arguably the danger is you can become more remote from communities. The job is so much more complex uh, than when I joined 25 years ago in London. So on, the, on one hand, um, that maybe kind of undermines the relationship, but on the other hand, of course, in the last five years in particular, um, neighbourhood policing uh, in every single force uh, in the country, uh, a real commitment to understanding local community uh, priorities uh, and addressing them uh, is something which I think has done an awful lot to, to, to uh, bring us much closer to community concerns. And the third thing I would say about the past, and it's picking up the point I think that Peter Bottomley was making, maybe Blair was making, about the whole sense of actually if we can encourage people to self-police that's a win-win for everybody. And, and the thing that I was just going to mention, um, some of you might be familiar with it, um, Tom Tyler's work in America on procedural justice. The argument that basically um, trust and cooperation with the police is dependent on whether people think that our power is legitimate. And I think that's a really, really uh, useful link between that and big society, that sense in which um, Tyler's first principle around legitimacy is if people think they participated in the decisions you're making. If they think you've listened to them, they're much more likely to go along with what's being required. Participation, it isn't big society really about participation. So I think, um, you know, from a policing point of view, to kind of explore the link between big society and procedural justice and legitimacy, uh, I think is a really uh, beneficial uh, scene to explore. In terms of current practice, um, Philip will talk about what they're doing in um, <coughs> Hampshire. I, I'm not sure I agree with the police minister um, that actually community activism uh, is low in the police service. I would argue that actually volunteering runs through contemporary policing. And I just give you the numbers. Uh, in my own force, over 500 special festivals. <coughs> we have over 600 police support volunteers. They don't wear uniforms, but they run a lot of the uh, front counters in the more rural areas. Um, they do all sorts of things. We've got, we've got over 100 now, we're under 25 who help us explain how to communicate with young people, who help us with some of our social media issues. Uh, we have over 750 Muslim shoppers. There are people who will go into our front counters, test the service and fill out uh, a little survey online to give us feedback. Uh, we have hundreds of people in our neighbourhood action groups across the force. Uh, we have probably about 150 people doing street pastors now. And if we included everybody who is rather not as an armchair activist named to watch, that's thousands. So I, I wouldn't agree that it's necessarily low, what I do agree with is so much more potential to be higher. But I think we start on a pretty strong platform. So, so what are we doing in, in the Thames Valley? Um, in common with many other forces, um, seeking to increase the numbers of specials. Uh, and we are um, a lot higher now than we've ever been. Uh, but my big issue is not just about numbers, it's about outcomes as well, and, and how many of them uh, are fit for independent patrol, and how many are doing uh, the hours that are required, and, and, and moreover, uh, on top of that. So special are really, really important. Um, and one of the things that we are working with the Royal Borough of Windsor Maidenhead, which is one of the uh, trailblazer sites for Big Society, is looking at how we can incentivise people to join the specials. At the moment, we're talking about nectar points. What I would much prefer us to do is give people a discount on council tax, which is the case uh, down actually in, in Southampton in, in Hampshire. How can we incentivise people to uh, put on a uniform and go out uh, and support their police and protect their communities? We're also doing some very interesting work down in Slough with the Police Foundation. <coughs> um, one of the things we're quite keen to do is to understand how levels of participation and engagement can differ in different communities with very different um, histories uh, and legacies. And so we're doing some work with the foundation, uh, working on how can we find and develop new ways of working with new communities, maybe with communities which have been in this country uh, less time, uh, to ensure that we're working with them to reduce crime and disorder. So that's really quite an exciting uh, uh, 
project we've just pushed, um, kicked off a few months ago. And I think the other thing, it links into my procedural justice point, that I do think the, um, the whole redefinition of type loose between uh, central government and, and local police forces will be helpful, uh, and as part of that, uh, a greater emphasis on police officer discretion, a greater emphasis on restorative justice, a greater emphasis on community justice approaches. So I think that's all part of the package, and I think that's some of the things that Rob Morgan was suggesting. But I would, uh, as a student of Larry Sherman, say the most important thing to do is we need to develop an evidence base for this. Um, these all sound like good ideas, they make us feel warm, but actually what really does work, what does deliver tangible benefits for our communities. Thank you. Thank you very much. Phil Kedge, District Commander from East Hampshire and founder of Streetwatch. I've already used my pen to strike out the um, quote by Sir Robert Peel. <laughs> <laughs> However, why is it that we're all standing here today and actually mentioning Sir Robert Peel? Is it because actually we've moved so far away from those principles over the last maybe 10 years that it's time to return to them? And that's why I, as a district commander, felt and why I set up Streetwatch. Streetwatch is the only regulated model for citizen patrols that exist in, in the UK. Um, that's inclusive of its own commu community. And I, I, I mentioned the word inclusive because, of course, we've got the fantastic faith based patrols as well. And this is very much about the communities and the wider community. It's currently endorsed by a quarter of UK police forces at ACPO level, and its strength is in four principles. Firstly, it's independence. It operates by the community for the community. Although I developed it, it's not a police model, I handed it over. And I de developed it as a citizen, also within my na own neighbourhood. The second principle is that it's a partnership. And this is where it becomes interesting. This is about the communities and citizens saying, this is where we live and we want to take pride in it. But what we want to do, as part of our empowerment, is to invite the police to work in partnership with us as the citizens. And that's something which maybe we're not very used to, being invited to work in partnership with people. It's about citizenship and not policing. And we can't underestimate the authority and power of good citizenship. And I'll come on to that a bit later. But people bring back the values that they say that they've lost, the values of community cohesion, where people can provide their own visibility, their own reassurance, <coughs> and where they can tackle low levels of antisocial behaviour and crime responsibly, and take back ownership of their public places. The fourth principle is that of regulation. You know, we have a real responsibility here to make sure that any guidance we give we ensure that we minimise risk and the potential for harm. So Streetwatch is regulated through a constitution, codes of practice, guides, risk assessments and insurance. Now those four principles, independence, partnership, citizenship, regulation, I think is essential to any strategy designed to empower citizens working in partnership with the police. So what's the Streetwatch story? 2007. I saw what I believed to be a gap in the way in which we as police were engaging with our communities. And that gap was around community empowerment. I saw communities who had a disproportionate fear of crime, or who were actually suffering from real crime and victims, and they had retreated away from their open spaces. Undesirable elements then taken over those, those, those open spaces. As a result, people became more reliant on us as police to actually deal with the local issues, which they used to perhaps have dealt with. When we didn't <coughs> respond to their expectations, clearly their confidence in us would decline. And I wanted to find a way where I could break that cycle of what I call dependency and disempowerment. And so what I did is I invited members of the public 
to patrol their own streets. And I said that I'll go out and patrol them with them as a street watch member. I developed then a model over four years for citizen patrols, which is now a nationally regulated model for the Court of the UK Forces signed up at Act 11. Just a quick case study, I think this gives you a flavour. This lady was a victim of crime and social behaviour <coughs> persistently, and she had a house in the market wanted to move out in the area. In my neighbourhood, we're experiencing groups of youths of various ages on numerous occasions being rowdy, shouting, swearing, drinking. I get the picture. Eggs are being thrown at neighbours' windows, climbing on lampposts, pulling down fences. They'll be picking up rubbish, bottles, syringes, cans of drink, fish and chip cartons. So really impacted for the community having to go and, and put all that right. She wanted to do something that would change their behaviour and to get them to show their respect and to stop their antisocial behaviour. Now she says, by being out on patrol, we have come to befriend the group of youths who we felt intimidated by. We have names to faces and we stop and chat to them and ask them what they're up to and we try to take an interest in what they're doing. Due to Street Watch being out there for as little as a couple of hours a week, they have made a difference. Some residents appreciate what we do and feel relieved when they see us. It gives a sense of well-being, especially to the elderly who are pleased we're doing it. As a result of Street Watch, I now know the local youths. I no longer feel intimidated by them and problems have greatly improved. I feel as if we have the support of the local police and I no longer consider myself to be a victim. What happened in that community was solved within the three months of the community engaging, whereas prior to that, I would say in the previous 18 months, as a police service and partnership, we weren't able to address their persistent issues in a long and sustainable manner. That cost 50 quid. Whilst previously I could easily spend £2,000 every weekend providing high visibility to policing. Why does it work? Very simple. Street watch members ask themselves a question. They say, if I was walking down my street and I saw something happening which was undermining my community, what would I do? I'll do something and not nothing. What is that something? It could be anything from observing, it could be from going up, introducing yourself, befriending, it could be about signposting, educating, it could be about appropriate changing or of course of this crime and process, pick up the phone, it's about good citizenship. So what are the barriers? And I mentioned three. Empowering people is dangerous. I would have to say that these barriers are actually from internal rather than external. I kind of find the people easy, they get it. And they want to do it, they've got their hands up. Nothing in life is risk-free. We know that. So Paul Stevenson, the Metropolitan Police Commissioner, says recently, there is a risk for citizens challenge illegal behaviour, but the risk to society of disencouraging them is infinitely greater. He added, the last thing we want is a walk on by society because police alone cannot hold the line. It's the point that the risk of society of disencouraging them is infinitely greater. I make an analogy as well in the, within the um, health service. Two million people a year seek attention through casualty departments or sports related in injuries. But you don't get the NHS saying don't play sports because it's dangerous. So why do we have a culture where we try to disencourage people to look after their own communities? Because it's for the greater good of their communities. The second barrier is very um, instinctive and cultural. It's about the police. We like to command and control, and we do. That's our job. And letting go is actually very difficult. To be able to trust the skills and experience in other people. And we need to stop viewing residents as just victims and customers and actually invite them to come and work with us as partners. Sylvia, a 77 year old lady who's been doing street work for three years, she's gone through all the hard life, hardships in life. She's been professionally employed all her life. She said if street watch was available 10 years ago, we would have got 10 years of community service out of her. She says that she knows her community better than the police do, and she's absolutely right. She quote, 
It's about time that authorities stop treating children like adults and adults like children. Absolutely right. The third barrier, and the last one, is a notion of national support and funding. I think the message around localism is getting confused. <coughs> this idea that these schemes can just pop up all over the place without any effort at all, or without any national funding or sponsorship. We have to look at this in a common sense way. We can either, from a national position, be able to provide the advice, expertise, confidence and guidance, or have 43 forces all duplicating effort and implementing schemes to varying standards. The demand on street watch now is so great across the port of the UK police forces that it now needs a national lead at the cost of £100,000 to roll out across the country. And I'm struggling to find anyone nationally to provide that money. I'll leave with a thought. At a conference recently, a very senior figure said, it's very unfortunate that communities have learned to accept low levels of crime and antisocial behaviour. My take on that is slightly different. I actually believe that communities have become so disempowered that they've had no choice but to accept antisocial behaviour. And I think it's incumbent on us as a public sector and the police service to start empowering them to take responsibility <coughs> back. And I end with a phrase which says, just do it. Because there's communities out there who are waiting for us to respond. They've heard the big society, they've heard community activism, they get it. <coughs> Everywhere I go, people coming forward saying, we want to do this. And I think for us, it's a time for talk has got to stop, and the action has got to begin, and we have to provide people with opportunities. Thank you very much. Martin in this Cardiff University. Um, in the lead up to the comprehensive spending review last year, um, a number of senior police officers started talking about the fact that policing was going to have to do more with less. But I think if we're going to take big society thinking seriously, actually what it's about is doing less with more. There are going to be less police officers, but they're going to have to engage with more individuals, more communities, more organisations. And if there's going to be less policing, when they do intervene, They've got to do so with more impact. They've got to be smaller, smarter, and sharper in terms of how policing is delivered. And in terms of making sense of how big society works through in relation to, to, to the conduct of policing, I think there are kind of three driving principles. The first is finding ways to see like a citizen. Rather than saying, we the police know what is best for communities, actually, you've got to give some of that power over to communities to define the problem. Second, as Philip just talked about, um, you've got to find ways to, to allow participative policing, get people involved. And then thirdly, you've got to make your, your own services more see-through, more transparent, in order that people can understand why you're doing what you're doing, why you're allocating resources to particular problems rather than others. Because demand is always going to outstrip supply. So actually, there are choices that have to be made. Um, so I think my, my role here is just to talk a little bit, well, what do we know in terms of the evidence base, um, in terms of this, these new ways of, of, of working? And, and for the last 10 years or so, I've been leading a research uh, program that has looked at different ways in which, in terms of the academic, academic jargon, how formal agencies, how formal social control articulates within formal social control. So the intersection between formal agencies and what communities do for themselves. Um, and where we first came across this was in the National Reassurance Policing Programme, which was the forerunner of um, neighbourhood policing. Um, in the National Reassurance Policing Programme, we tried to, to do some experiments and to test what happens if the police work with communities directly. And actually, we found that there are some significant benefits that come from this. Um, in four of the six, 16 sites where this was trialled, people said that they trusted their neighbours more after 12 months through working with the police. In one particular site in Lancashire, 
There's a 14% increase in the level of community cohesion. But despite, despite these results, when we move from the reassurance program into neighborhood policing and performance program, that element was dropped working with communities. The role of communities was reduced to being consulted rather than actively engaged. Why is that? Because actually, this kind of working is quite hard. It requires new and different skills of police officers that they don't necessarily feel comfortable with. So since um, this work in 2003 to 2005, we've been continually trying to work this out. Um, and we've been working particularly in South Wales over an extended period of time, four years in South Wales, five years in Sutton, and five years in Lancashire, looking at how can the police interact with communities and work with communities. And in South Wales, um, we, we have um, been doing a piece of work where we encourage the police, PCSOs, to go out and interview members of the public in depth about their security needs or concerns. Uh, and to cover the whole of South Wales, we did four and a half thousand face-to-face uh, -face interviews conducted by police officers, sitting down with members of the public saying, tell us what concerns you. There are some important results that, that come out of this. Firstly, there is a high degree of variation. Even within the city of Cardiff, each neighbourhood in Cardiff had different priorities. So that represents a significant challenge for the police, because you can't have even at a city level, standardised services all being delivered centrally, if you are going to be truly responsive to what communities need and want from you. Services have to be differentiated um, and put together in far more of a mosaic type fashion. But this, this piece of work has been very, very challenging for the police. Um, in one area of Cardiff in particular, we found that the public were talking a lot about signs of drug use in their neighbourhood. When we took that information back to the police, they said, no, we've got nothing in our intelligence system that says there are drug problems in this neighborhood. There's nothing that we've got from our covert sources that say there's a problem. And so it kind of got put to one side for a while. But luckily, one senior officer picked up and said, well, we'd better go and check this out. He went and put covert assets into this area and discovered that there was, in fact, a rampant drug market in this area of Cardiff that hadn't been picked up by uh, the police's former intelligence mechanisms. So they launched an operation, and on the basis of this operation, um, they ended up conducting 184 Class A um, drug dealer arrests. So they arrested 184 people. The courts have subsequently put down uh, 200 years' worth of sentences. They see six <coughs> kilos of crack, cocaine, and heroin. Um, and on the back of the operation, Serious acquisitive crime in that area has dropped by 36%, and antisocial behaviour has dropped by 25%. But the interesting issue there is, why wasn't this picked up by other groups? There is an assumption sometimes within the police that actually we know what's going on, that we've got our finger on the pulse, we know what's happening here. That can't always be taken for granted. And so, actually, if we're going to take this agenda seriously, it's not just about volunteers and things like that. It's actually ceding some of the power away from the police to allow communities to define what the problems are, and actually accepting that sometimes they might be right, even if you don't think so. A second quick example of where this big society work is, is, is happening is actually in relation to the prevent agenda. One of the areas that we've, we've seen um, this happening is in terms of how communities are dealing with um, people attempting to conduct radicalisation in particular areas. Uh, we've got a report coming out uh, next month um, for, for ACPO where we're going to talk a bit more about this. But actually it's very, very interesting because what we're seeing is that in some areas communities are taking responsibility for challenging extremist groups on the basis that very often the activities of these groups are troublesome, they're antisocial, they're problematic, but they're not illegal. So communities are actually taking responsibility now for fronting up extremists, challenging them in public, going along, saying, we don't want you here, disrupting <coughs> the work of these extremist groups. But the point about that is, these kinds of working present new challenges. 
new problems that have to be solved. In particular, in relation to the preventive example, what are the police able to do if the extremists start to push back? How do you protect the people defending <coughs> communities? Because actually that's what we're seeing coming up now, is that communities are taking a stand and they're putting themselves at personal risk. But what do you do then in order to protect them, to keep that momentum going? How do you protect the defenders? And there is evidence that this happens in other ways. We've done an analysis of British crime survey. And one of the things that our analysis um, shows is that people who volunteer, who engage uh, in community activism, experience greater levels of verbal harassment and verbal abuse in the process of doing that work. So again, this challenge comes up. If people are going to take a stand, what's in place to help them and protect them if the bad guys start pushing back. And I think that's an interesting issue, I think, that, that perhaps we, we, we ought to attend more to and uh, have a grown-up conversation about. There's, there's sometimes an assumption here that we can separate out the good guys from the bad guys. Actually, real life is a bit more messy than that. And people who are victims are often also the offenders. So who are you going to engage? in these efforts? Who are you working with? And in certain communities that, that you go to, it's important to recognise that in many ways it's the bad guys who are in control. There are certain areas of London, there are certain areas of Wales that I can take you to, where actually the street gangs are supplying social control. If you get mugged or robbed, they're far more effective in getting your stuff back for you, they do it far more quickly than the police will ever manage to do. And that's you know, what life is like in some of these areas. So what are the implications here? Um, well, I think one of the implications that, that comes through is in policing, um, there is, there's a long been a recognition of high value informants. That is, people who know stuff that is very, very valuable. What the evidence that we've got from our programme of field studies suggests is that similarly there are high value networkers in communities. There are people who are particularly important in terms of their ability to mobilise communities, to bring people together, to get people active and working. You need to be able to identify those people, support those people, and if things go wrong, protect them. So there are a number of ways in which this big society-based policing seems to take off. What our evidence suggests is, in some cases, it occurs because the police aren't seen as being effective in an area. So actually, communities mobilise to supply social control that they don't think is good from the police. In other areas, and at other occasions, actually, you need the police to build trust and confidence in order that this community mobilisation of big society can happen. So there are different routes here. But one of the things that, that slightly concerns me uh, uh, about how things are shaping up is that our institutions try to institutionalise the work of communities. One of the things that we've seen happen in a number of areas is that actually community mobilisation isn't an always-on phenomenon. It's not consistent, it's not there all the time. Communities mobilise around a particular issue, then the group dissipates and it goes away again. And then they might come back at another point in time for another issue, and then it goes away again. That on-off, on-off fluidity, adaptability and change, I think is really important in understanding this. Because if we expect that the communities are always going to be in a position to continually engage at ten of pack meetings, go on street patrol, continually going to do that, I think we may be left disappointed and communities may not be able to bear the weight of expectation that's being placed upon them. Thank you. Okay, we'll open up the floor now for um, any questions. And please, if you're asking a question, can you just say uh, who you are and your affiliation, and then ideally who else you'd like to answer on the panel.
there's a microphone going around as well. Uh, Bernard Morgan here, please say to your mic. Um, probably just two points really. One, broadly, people I think will support the idea of a big society where your volunteers take more part. I can see Nick Turner's point, which is that probably government doesn't need to direct what people do locally. But probably there are some things for a government to think about what it continues to need to do. And just to describe two things really. One, how will we know where we got there? So, you know, if there's a level of community support now, what is it we aspire to? So, you know, is it a proportion? Is it a number? Is it the quality of the intervention? So perhaps we can describe that as that might be helpful. Um, and number two, really, I suppose it's just trying to get the best of the past and make sure that in the volunteering groups they replicate that. So if you look at some of the things that seem to have worked well in the past, are in line. We've been for many years. Um, community Public Security Trust, the Jewish security organisation, it seems to me there are some fundamental principles that apply to different types of good volunteering. One might be funding, which isn't always good with funding. We'll come to those two examples, they run through community funding, uh, particularly to understand business. Uh, number two is a level of organisation at the centre that provides at least a model idea as to how this can be done well, to coordinate, if not to direct. And so the two things, one, how we work out there, number two is how can we share what good volunteering system can work. Martin, do you want to um, address the issue of metrics? How do we measure success in a big society? Is there such a uh, thing as a successful you know, metric of volunteering? Um, one of the things we've been trying to do in um, South Wales is um, work out can you measure the social harm of crime? So rather than just um, how many crimes are happening, um, can, you, can you measure the impact that crime is happening and therefore could you reduce? the heart. But I think actually it's, it's not just a linguistic shift, it's a conceptual shift. Because actually, if you like, the performance metrics of policing, how much crime happens in the world. But actually, you know, we know from the research that we've done that not all crime lands in public. You know, a lot of it can be tolerated with people. But there are certain things that are particularly harmful. Um, and, and you do need that shift, that conceptual shift, I think, to thinking about the harm of crime. Because um, that's what's important to communities. That's what's going to mobilise them. They're, they're less interested. Has the aggregate crime rate gone up? But has the harm of crime in my neighbourhood changed? So I, I think there is an important thing there. Yeah, thank you. To uh, <coughs> about how you might uh, judge whether you've been successful, I do think numbers matter in this. And so when the Minister talks about the numbers of special constables after the Second World War and the, and the decline, I think that try to get back, if not to those numbers, um, to something a lot higher than we are at the moment. I think that would make a huge difference. Uh, and I think um, we sometimes feel we're kind of surveyed out, but I do think there is uh, an important use of surveys to see how people are feeling, how well they feel engaged and supported, uh, and I think that needs to be part of the kind of, whether it's a particular survey, or whether it's uh, other parts of uh, surveys that are done locally or national, I do think that sort of positive measure I can take the second part of the question about the um, funding and support. I think Streetwatch is a very good example of this actually happening. Because what you have is it's becoming a victim of its own success. The amount of police force which is now buying into it, for it to continue to work and function, you need to have some top-down support, even though the organisation was very much a, a bottom-up. Now, I think what people aren't understanding is that it actually takes a very small amount of money nationally to provide people locally with the support and encouragement that they need. And I think we've got to reevaluate actually what's in their bank and what can actually work. The other bit I think is very important is to listen to the people. Because what they are saying is this if we're going out to empower ourselves to tackle crime, actually, we want to know that we have the support of National Anglo. We want to know that we have the support of our elected leaders and HMIC. So why aren't those three people putting their hands in their pockets and providing this small amount of money to reassure us that we should be doing this? And that message, I think, is being lost, and I think we need to address it. Okay, um, this more questions about Rob. Uh, thank you, I'm, I'm Rob Beckley, I'm the uh, Deputy Chief Constable for Aiden and Somerset, and 
I, I had a gift a couple of weeks ago and was given the um, ACPO lead on big societies. <laughs> uh, I hasten to add this was after the invitations. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, oh, thank, thank you, Blair. Uh, it, 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 but, well, I mean, in fact, it's good because it's an opportunity to listen and absorb some of the different perspectives. And, uh, and, uh, and I think that's the challenge because this, I've had a couple of difficult ACPO responsibilities in the past, and this is the first one I've had people commiserate with me. <laughs> um, and, and, and it isn't because there isn't a, an underlying enthusiastic about, enthusiasm about this. There's a real energy behind a lot of elements of this. It's the breadth of it. Uh, because we're talking about a lot of things to a lot of people. So we're talking about um, cultural change as well as practical initiatives. Uh, we're talking about stuff inside the police service as well as outside the police service. Uh, and, and we're talking across, um, as we've heard today, uh, I think, a very wide range of outcomes. You've sort of answered some questions about metrics, but we're also talking about, is it about confidence? Is it about community cohesion? Is it about fear or harm of crime or actual reduction of crime? And I think it's that breadth that is the challenge. And I suppose the question behind that is, where is the focus? Where should the focus be at times when uh, there's a lot of fronts that we're operating in? And, and then, you know, you've talked a little bit about success, but what really will be success here? Okay, and I'll take um, just one more question here as well. Hello, my name is Simon Gordon. Uh, I run Gordon's Wine Bar in Bellier Street. And uh, just wanted to just mention that we need a little bit here. It's, it's an example of what we've done. We got fed up um, with crime in Gordon's Wine Bar, low level crime, bag thefts, and so on. And I've started a, a system called FaceWatch, which is free to the police, which enables companies to report crime online, including moving CCTV, images, witness statements, everything's online. And the way we've got that funded is actually by getting the premises to pay a small amount each month. Because I believe passionately that everybody's got to do more. And um, we just set that up for our little area but actually now we're just about to go national. But what it does, it takes away all that walking around, tracing the streets that the police are doing at the moment, trying to collect CCTV, and wasting their time because people don't give them the information the way they can use. So um, watch out for face watch, but it's just an example of something where we're sort of just trying to build something up. And again, we didn't rely, we couldn't rely on the funding because as soon as I mentioned the word funding, uh, I was gonna be, covered in committees, all sorts of people who wanted to say no, and we've been working for the next three or four years trying to get some off the ground. We've done this in a year, and we're already fully approved. And so, just about to say. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, Martin, um, what specifically do you want to say about that? Martin, Rob's point about um, the breadth of this, what, what would you identify as the most important element? If, if, if it's led by the government or not, over the next three or four years, what would you like to see a real focus on? Um, I, I totally agree with the uh, we need a measurement framework. <coughs> Otherwise, you can't, um, you can't put direction into it. And, and that's not for, for you know, I, I don't know what that will be. I, I've plumbed for hard just on the basis that I think in, in, if times are tight and um, you haven't got any money, um, then what the, pub, the public want? to do most. They want them to protect them from harm as opposed to a more expansive vision of promoting community well-being. Okay, um, I'll have a go at a few of those. Um, Rob, where is the focus? I would suggest that um, now you're the ACPO leader, you should be up here, not me. Um, <laughs> 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 you can call the committee. Yes, um, you know, I, I would be looking for three or four good ideas that are out there and have you know, the point I make about like evaluation of the review of some made it's really important. You, know, you can't do everything. Let's focus on a few priority kind of projects and work out what works um, and, and get a decent evidence base. That's how I said about because I, I mean I deliberately used uh, Robin Morgan's rather controversial quotation just to, to demonstrate the potential breadth of this. Because I do think there's a whole range of issues in the criminal justice system, not just in policing, you know, particularly around working with offenders, particularly you know, organisations, 
organisations like Circles of Support, who work with sex offenders, huge amount of uh, potential. And I think that, to be clear, probably across the criminal justice agency, where we're going to focus. But the second point, I mean, your point about technology, um, I guess if the minister was here, he'd be getting very excited about that, because that's his whole point about crime mapping. And you know, sure already has. <laughs> okay, well, because, because yeah. the idea is, you know, crime mapping is like just step one. They want you know everybody to have it on their apps and, and all this kind of stuff, and really get a much greater engagement with people, much more transparent availability of information, and a much greater kind of citizen engagement in some of the issues. And I think you know data, pictures, film is absolutely key to that. So I, I think you know in technology we've got a huge now. Of course, by the way, the information commissioner and people like that get terribly excited about data protection, and you know we have to take our responsibility seriously. He's already excited about that. You're okay. You're legitimate. Very good. Um, no. But I do think technology is a huge uh, potential lead for us. And the third point would be about the point you made about funding. Um, we work with some pretty um, kind of enthusiastic people in Thames Valley who will sometimes say one of the barriers to participation is the very kind of bureaucratic processes that we've developed over the years. And so I do think we need to think about, and I think maybe to make a similar point, you know, you can't expect people to come and work on your terms. There's got to be some kind of give and take. And I think around the point we made about committees and the process is, is a really strong point. Uh, and I guess that's why Rob says it is a bit about cultural change in our own organisation that we don't always know best, but actually there could be a different way of doing something. Okay, two more. Um, jump on here and then uh, shortly. <coughs> uh, I'm um, Phil Hagen, and six years ago I was commander of New Scotland Yard. The past six years I've been the head of corporate security for Sainsbury's and uh, my, my point I think is about um, the role of business in this. We, we've actually talked quite a bit this afternoon. I haven't heard the word business you know, uh, come up a lot. And business community is indeed part of our community and I think personally, you know, it may sound a bit like to uh, poach its own thank you. <laughs> but I think the interaction of policing with business is unexploited and certainly it's not as sound as it should be. And I'll give you some examples where business can actually play a sound role, I think, in the big society. And working with this with um, James Broken Shah and his previous uh, incumbents of that post um, and the British Retail Consortium. I mean, Sainsbury's alone, for example, uh, we have the world's first. Uh, police recruit training unit in a supermarket at Barclays. We have 36 police bases in, in our stores across the country. Uh, we lead uh, in a pilot on employer supported policing in the eastern England at the moment to provide special constables. Uh, we support Simon's face watch and a plethora of other things, community alcohol partnerships, and so on and so forth. But I have to say, as an observation, it is quite difficult working with the police. And I say that, you know, um, on the basis of I've spent 33 years of my life policing. And I don't like anything to say anything negative about the police forces, but it is quite hard work. Okay, and uh, Sean? Sure. Hello, Sean. Mine's very quick. I'm just intrigued by something Sarah mentioned about the incentives for special constables. Especially nectar points, council taxes. I didn't know if Philip noticed that I just said that. I do an inadvertent commercial plug. One of them is. Let me do the easy one first, which is a matter of fact. Um, it is the case um, that special constables either working or living in Southampton uh, do get a substantial discount off their council tax. And when I have been uh, talking to councils in Thames Valley, I've talked about um, what sort of things the local authorities could do to assist. It's exactly the same point that Phil's making about employers. Some employers do encourage uh, their staff to, to be special constables and give them time off. We have special constables who have time off from their employers. And I would argue, and in fact I wrote to a lot of employers in Thames Valley uh, about six months ago, uh, putting this uh, proposal to them, uh, because I would argue that if you've got a member of staff who is working with us as a special constable, then in fact they're gaining very valuable skills which they'll take back into your workplace, whether it's about uh, personal resilience, problem solving, leadership, uh, remaining calm under pressure, whatever. 
I would say actually it's not just uh, a donation by an employer, but actually you can create, create a win-win. Uh, and, and clearly, uh, Phil's company uh, is of that mind as well, but only in the east of England, Phil. Well, it's a pile, but I mean, we've got 34 specials in the workforce. And the point I made about loyalty cards um, is that it's one of the um, ideas that we're working on uh, in the uh, Royal Borough of Windsor and Maidenhead, as I say, because they're a trailblazer for big society. We're just trying to work out different ways to incentivize us. And that's one of the ideas that we're looking at. It's not happened yet. Okay. I agree entirely with your point. I think it's a huge untapped resource for support in the business community. Not mentioning any other major retailer, but there is one in Bedfordshire. Um, who's now agreed to have their staff um, take part in community patrol schemes uh, two hours a week to support the local community. And this is where, again, I have the problem because a lot of this now is starting to be focused around what you know, we're supporting the police in doing this, or the police have asked us to do this. We're supporting a police initiative. I kind of want to take us away from being that middle person because our whole point of empowering communities is actually for the communities and the big retailers to get together <coughs> and to work out between them how they can support their communities. And then we're there as a partner. But it's always kind of the police driving so many of these initiatives. And for me, community empowerment is saying to the community groups, you know, you contact the retailers and the retailers talk together. I'm not sure how much that always happens. Um, on the business front, I mean, we've done a couple of projects, one in the city of London and um, one in Wales as well for WAG, that I actually think it cuts both ways. Um, in, that um, in one supermarket in one town, their stock shrinkage was about £10,000 a week, a lot of which was being used to fuel the local drug market, but very little of which was actually being reported to the police mm -hmm. because it was not of a value to the, to the operator there. That, that it's worth their while in terms of their overall profit. So actually, I think there's kind of this corporate safety responsibility element here as well about improving the reporting. But I do accept the point that the police have got to be receptive to that. Um, because what we found when we looked at this was there was a lot of high value portable items going out of the stores being resold in the local, in among smaller stores. Um, and actually through the drone. That's what was going on. Um, so actually it kind of cuts both ways. Okay, some more questions? <coughs> yep, question here. Jeff Knopf from the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds. Uh, as you might guess, my particular interest is in wildlife crime, but I'm assuming there can also be lessons learned from other similar types of crime. How does the panel think the kind of uh, ideas and changes we've talked about today could be used, or indeed to what extent they could be used, to tackle complex types of crime with quite specific uh, issues that often occur across boundaries, across force and regional boundaries like wildlife crime? Okay, and then a question from uh, Robert uh, There uh, seems to be a Robert McFarlane, really sort of independent, I suppose, in the first description. Um, there seems to be an underlying conflict between um, <coughs> Philip's Streetwatch project, which genuinely seems to be a big society in the sense that it's community led and relationship with the police as a, as a side. Effect, in other words, the community is taking charge of one or more aspects of its regular. I mean, I'm both looking for those and, and making sure that the open spaces are kept clean, tidy, and, um, and, and dug over as well. Um, and the other examples, which have effectively concentrated on harm, protection of the community from harm. And there are all sorts of words which then spring to mind, which haven't been mentioned, like vigilante groups, spying, informing, um, even police state. I mean, this is how the Stasi worked, to be very, very extreme. And 
That aspect is surely not part of the philosophy of the big society. And indeed has implications which are rather sinister, potentially. And I wonder if the panel had any can I just reinforce that? I, I was interested particularly in what you said about working with new communities. And I think uh, the police's role as a dealer out of justice versus the police's role as protector of communities would be very sharply in conflict in some of those new communities. Something of your Okay, thanks. Okay, I'll, um, I'll deal with both questions. I'll deal with the wildlife one first because I know there's a very straightforward answer to that. I mean, I've, uh, two of the uh, voluntary organisations which weren't on my list actually uh, in terms of having held both a horse watch and a dog watch um, both arose out of real community concerns about thefts of horses and thefts of dogs uh, the dog watch in particular you know a decent dog is worth a lot of money um, and it's really quite a very active uh, you know internet based uh, watch now uh, and to be perfectly honest and, and the guy who runs it would, would, would I'm sure support me on this he and I had a, an anxious time, probably about three or four years ago, when he was quite cross about his response. Uh, and in the end, we got ourselves organized, and we got him and a lot of his uh, concerned neighbors involved. Um, and in fact, we've been really supporting some of the local MPs. Things have been a lot better now, in terms of, you know, we're alive to the issues, but they're very much engaged in them. So what was quite a, a difficult relationship for me, um, in terms of, feeling in rural communities in particular being let down has turned into something quite positive. And I, I think I even am on their website saying what a good thing the dog watch is. So, so um, I do think there is potential, you know, particularly where you've got different sorts of communities of interest, and maybe around uh, wildlife and animals. But do you do dogs and horses as wildlife? A tamed life, I suppose. More captive. Okay. More than a But but the point is, um, if you've got people who are in a community of interest, uh, I do think then there is great scope. In terms of your point, uh, Sarah, about uh, is there a scope for vigilanteism uh, and uh, informing a spying, um, I guess with any good idea, there's always potential for it to be used uh, in a way which is very negative and undermining. And I just think we have to be very conscious of that. Um, that is not at all what is required. Uh, and then linking with the point about the work we want to do uh, in, in SLAM, I think that that's very important about understanding that new communities do have very different experiences um, and what um, drives their views around the legitimacy of uh, policing uh, might be very different this is why we want to explore it because very often um, when you talk about uh, the big society people will say well it's all very well for middle class communities who've got this social capital to do this what about more disadvantaged communities and that's one of the reasons why we want to do some work in Slough to see actually how can we find new ways of working that engage people as it's kind of co-producers in their protection <laughs> rather than just kind of imposing the state uh, uh, so I think it's really really important. Thank you, there's two great questions. I want to just do both very quick if I may. Um, I received a letter as a district commander from a, a, a gentleman who's in our country watch here saying that after his farm was burgled, um, why did it take 48 hours for the local officer to get on the text or ring round system and tell everyone else in their neighbourhood that his farm had been burgled. This gentleman was a, was a um, member of Country Watch. To which I replied, well, after you knew you got burgled, why didn't you text everyone in your immediate area to tell them that you'd been burgled? And why did you wait 48, 48 hours for the police to do it? And I think if we do things <coughs> incorrectly with the wrong message. We're again just disempowering communities, making them rely on us to do the work that they can do for themselves. If we turn around to them and say, we will do everything we can to solve this crime. But actually that ring round system is good. So why don't you use it to the best of ability and we'll support you. So I think we, in everything we can do, we've got to turn it around a bit and then go for this empowerment agenda. Citizen patrols, you know, the vigilantes and spying, Citizen patrols is not an idea. Citizen patrols is a civil right. We just didn't come up with this idea that people can walk their own streets. They do it every day. And, that, and we're not asking people to do anything more than what someone would do every day when they're walking the streets providing good citizenship. However, what I would say is that if we want to allow people to have the opportunity, then we should allow them to do it as safely as possible. 
And that's why something like street watch and street pastors and street angels have taken you know four or five years to develop because what they do is put a framework around it to say this is fully regulated, this constitution's got a code of conduct. That allows confidence in the police, the public, partnerships, the local elected leaders to say, I know what, if someone's walking the street with that branding, we know that that's got the consent of the wider community. And that's what you need. If a group decides to do it without the consent of the community, no one can stop them. But actually, it won't survive because these things need that consent. And, and you have public liability insurance as well. Yeah, so public liability. Yeah. So the insurers think that this is yeah. not necessarily an incredibly risky. Well, no, the insurers look like it took a year to, to, to do the insurance. And they now say that um, this model is fit to operate in any village, town, or city in the UK at low risk. And in fact, Greater Manchester Police have launched their scheme of taking it to an area of high crime, high organised crime, and high drugs misuse. I walked around there with them the other day. Do you know what? Relatively, their communities, and, then, and the people who do it, they know their communities. They actually understand the risks. They actually know the people who engage in the crime. And I kind of, we have to, we have to allow these people to have that freedom to be able to take control, <coughs> back control of their own communities, and, and support them whilst they do it. And just a, lot, a few last questions. We've got a bit more time, so I'll get one there. I'm um, all been concerned uh, from the time I did the ACO 2007 study where we looked at the, the threats and issues that we're going to be keeping police over the next 10, 20 years. Um, about the role of the police service in the context of increased social um, polarisation. We've seen massive economic polarisation, we've seen the growth of sort gated of communities in like areas and so on all sorts of things over the last few years, and I think that that polarisation will continue. Now, my original research was in political participation. All the evidence then, here and internationally, and all the current evidence as well, they continue to be interesting, shows that whatever you do, the people who will participate will only ever be a small minority of society, and participation will be different. Now, in many areas, I mean, Martin's talked about different areas having different priorities and so on. That's, that's an important point to flag up. In most areas, you will have different sets of interests. You will not have a community. You will have different communities. I'm not just talking ethnicity. I'm talking young, old, and I'm talking uh, economic polarization, often cheap high down in some of our inner city areas. And some of those contrasts are the most extreme in your highest crime areas. Now, I do have some very, very serious concerns about how the police can get into this, think it through carefully, but build in sufficient safeguards and it goes to the party with, with them, uh, like my friend's uh, comment just here, we got it. Um, how the police can build in safeguards against a concern that I have long held that it will be co-opted by one section of society or the communities against others, and it needs to protect itself against that, not just for the sake of its own uh, credibility, legitimacy, and so on, but for the sake of social cohesion in the more general sense. Okay, thank you. Good question. Um, any, any further questions from the floor? Um, one, one there, and then I'll take one last question. Hi. Hi, I guess I'm, I'm just interested to hear um, people's thoughts on how this might transfer to areas like London, where you know, you've know you got a very much kind of, kind of polarised and segregated, well not probably segregated, it's really kind of uh, multifaceted communities, you know, so in parts of Brixton and, and other parts of London, it's not that easy to say, you know, there are people who represent a particular community. So I'm interested to hear, how do you bring that kind of initiative, the street, street, street stuff, over in a way that you maintain the, 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 the essence of it without, without losing it? Okay, and follow up back. Uh, Ed Boyd from Policy Exchange. Uh, Sarah, a question uh, for yourself. Um, Martin mentioned about how uh, communities often kind of rally around particular issues in terms of community involvement within uh, policing matters. Um, I want to know your, your thoughts on uh, in, how this relates to special principles, and in particular, whether you think there is a greater scope to, to use them uh, around either a particular interest that they have to be kind of uh, steward, police stewards of those areas, and also around particular skill sets that they might already have 
and the, the potential to, to use those skills to a greater extent in the specials. Okay, thanks. So, um, Marianne's question first. first thing. I think there's a bit of crossover between the two questions anyway in terms of, 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 of the groups. Um, do you know what? It's a, it's a tricky subject. And, I, and, and there's no kind of clear path through it, and we have to be very sensitive to it. And the first thing to say is to say this is about communities. And if we empower communities, we have to, in, in part, accept that they're going to be risks and there's problems, and we have to roll with them. Now, if we're going to have models like this, I think it's about getting the model right, which people understand and can buy into and understand before it starts. So it's about the development. I'll tell you what does scare me, and I hear it quite a lot, is that because of things like, you know, uh, to be cost neutral, I hear all the time, why don't we just have a scheme or model where we can put on the internet and allow anyone just to access it, turn down, pop up civilian street patrols or empowerment and allow people to get on with it. Actually, that is completely the wrong approach. We have to take this very steadily, very slowly, and start building confidence in communities. Which is why that, and it's why we need not only that sort of bottom-up approach, but we need to have national expertise, guidance, support, and help to allow people to understand what they're engaging in and to build reassurance around the wider communities of what's actually happening. But that kind of model requires some kind of investment, um, and I think that's a big divide between doing it on the cheap and quick or actually building a model over years which people are buying to understand and doing it well. You still get problems, but the risk is far, far less. Thank you. Um, I think the point uh, so I mean, we, we've got examples. I, I had to gloss over because we didn't have much, much time, but one of the examples that we had is, is actually where, um, in a particular area, where communities started patrolling and actually there was a split of polarisation arose in the community. <coughs> people who were doing the patrols were not liked by some of the other people and were seen as um, bearing down on their kids and stuff, being overly aggressive, roughing up their kids. Um, and, and actually, so the, it kind of it fractured, it polarised. Um, in, in, in terms of, I mean, some of the, the work that we've done has actually been in Brixton around gun crime and, and, and gun violence and, and looking at um, how the communities mobilise. Um, to, to deal with fairly serious kind of difficult problems. And actually what's interesting, a lot of the time they're mobilising outside of the police. They don't want the police involved. It slows them up, kind of brings in the bureaucratic kind of thing. There is a certain, within certain there's a tolerance for certain kinds of issues. That there is a, an understanding locally. You know, there's certain stuff here that if it happens, we the community will stand out and get a grip of it. But there's other things, you know, that, that's fine. And I think that's quite important for this this whole kind of uh, uh, agenda from, from a policing point of view, which is if you know that there's certain things going on in a community that are illegal, but actually the community are fairly accepted, what do you do about those in order to keep, sustain your relationship with that, that community? That seems to me to be a different, difficult, ethical, <coughs> and moral question. And then in relation to Ed's point, um, one of the things that used to happen in, in, in policing, um, and it's not so much about specials, but Actually, if you're a police officer in a certain area, you had to live in a certain area. And my, that give, and that kind of that ownership, that investment, <coughs> that, that's gone. The police officers are travelling miles to work, so they don't police and live in the community or near the communities that they're, they're, they're involved in. And, and maybe you ought to be thinking about, about that again, about how do we increase the investment and ownership of formal agents in, in terms of the areas that they're involved in. And just to answer Barry's point first, um, I think of course there are risks, and I think that's why I was suggesting to Rob that we need to think carefully and build up the evidence base when you make about safeguarding. Safeguarding I think is really important. Um, but that's not a reason not to do it. Um, in terms of a uh, particular question on, on specials, um, that is beginning to happen. Um, traditionally, I think the view is that special constables um, provide a uniform patrol. Um, there are quite a few forces now, including my own, which are getting more and more into saying, okay, what sort of skills do people bring? In particular, they've got maybe technical skills, financial accounting skills, um, and it would be 
much more useful and valuable for us for people to come and help us with those kind of difficult investigations rather than doing informal work. <coughs> so I think it is becoming more sophisticated as we kind of develop the idea. Okay, well I think that's, um, that's it for now, but thank you very much for such good questions from the floor as well. Um, it's clearly a huge subject that goes to, to Rob's point about the breadth of it. I don't think any, uh, any event on this scale could have done it justice, but I think it's, it's been a debate that's hopefully left you with some food um, for thought. Just so you're aware, the, the, the policing work the Policy Exchange is doing involves, a bit later on this year, some work on leasing 10 years now, so leasing in 2020. And I think a lot of these questions around how leasing might change are actually about what might happen in 10 years' time. These things can't happen necessarily overnight, but in 10 years' time, leasing could look very different from, it, uh, from the way it looks today. So if you are interested in that element, please do uh, contact me or feed into our, our research, and we'll be doing more on that in, in May. But thank you all for coming, and thank you as well to our panel for their contribution.